Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Ricardo Halis. I work in the University of Londrina, Paraná State, Brazil, and also for the Feder Brazilian Federation of No-Till and Irrigation, the farmers' organization in Brazil that promote the no-till system, Brazilian no-till system. So the idea is to begin this, these activities. I will be the coordinator to organize a little bit the time. I ask for the the presenters to, to keep the time. And if we will be successful, we can open for some questions, and that will be very useful for us. So another thing that we will change a little bit, because Alba is not here yet. So we will begin with Rick. Can you begin your presentation? And I will control the time. OK? We will change. Vamos cambiar. Uh, Passar para Rick. Ok? Gracias. Rick, please. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Now I'm going to present some of our research from Australia looking at both no-till, CA adoption and also uh, weed management. And it's really looking at the uh, co-evolution and hopefully uh, some patterns that you observe here. Okay, hopefully some patterns you observe here might be familiar because I think there's some uh, interesting learnings from uh, what we've experienced uh, in Australia with uh, no-till and the weed management uh, issue. So if you look at uh, these patterns, um, like most CA scenarios, it started with the prompt of tillage and erosion risk, uh, and then largely due to herbicide availability, trifluralin, cheap glyphosate, available selective herbicides, it was able to enable uh, no-till, cropping intensification and CA. Uh, but then very quickly, as the Australian experience shows, is that weeds evolve uh, herbicide resistance, but also some other weeds uh, obviously adapt very quickly to the uh, CA situation. And that uh, very rapidly led to uh, the need for farmers to evolve their own new weed management strategies that uh, potentially greatly shape how CA is uh, conducted. So that's a sort of co-evolution, and I think it, it fits uh, nicely with uh, the concept from ecological economics from Norgard, uh, where co-evolution doesn't necessarily lead to a win-win. It's uh, what farmers needed to do for survival for their cropping system. But uh, hopefully what we're heading towards is what uh, is, can be termed co-evolutionary development, where it is a evolution that leads to a win-win, both for sustainable weed management and CA. So first of all, let's just look at the uh, no-till pattern. You've probably seen uh, something uh, familiar in, in several countries. So this is no-till adoption, uh, the time that no-till uh, was adopted by the current farmers. We do a study like this every uh, few years, funded by the grains industry. Uh, this time around 600 growers, and you can see that split here into two regions, the western region of Australia where the most rapid uh, and, and highest adoption has occurred, and 90, around 90% 90 of cropland uh, under no-till. And in the southern regions, a little bit slower, uh, some more pasture, and more, more sheep, a few other factors there, slower and, and still lower, but you can see already reaching very high levels of around 73% of cropland under no-till systems. So this has enabled Australian farmers to respond to uh, what's been a real challenge. And some of my colleagues in CSIRO, CSIRO have recently shown that uh, when looking at yield potential due to climate, that has declined by 27% since 1990. And Australian farmers have managed to maintain their yields over that period. So basically by no-till and the associated technologies, they've managed to maintain yield despite uh, that potential declining by that much, which is a big achievement just to stand still. So there's no, uh, I don't, so there's no farmers uh, in Australia that aren't very aware of uh, the potential for climate change. But along this path, we've had uh, some of the most severe uh, evolution of weed issues in terms of herbicide resistance in particular. You can see Lolium uh, rigidum, ryegrass, the main weed there that's resistant. 
but also uh, bromus, which is in other weeds that are uh, not necessarily due to resistance, but they adapt very well to uh, no-till systems, and they become increasingly important and among the most uh, costly weeds now in Australia. So as weed populations and resistance have evolved, so too is the no-till and uh, weed management system, and that's what I'll, I'll focus on now. So the cost of weeds, uh, I don't, don't worry about the, the numbers here so much, but the point I'm trying to make with this uh, result of our recent study is just how much uh, Australian farmers are investing in management of weed populations relative to yield loss. So you can see the relative cost of management there in red compared to yield loss. So essentially farmers are investing very heavily in weed management to maintain low weed seed banks uh, to avoid the incurrence of yield loss. So often there's the perception that uh, weed numbers can get out of control when these sort of issues arise, but uh, farmers are investing heavily to maintain low seed banks and that's been one of the major shifts. And it's clear that maintaining low seed banks or low weed numbers is a management priority for farmers relative to maintaining strict uh, CA principles, which CA is generally the preferred uh, farming system for Australian farmers, but when faced with uh, weed issues like this, the weed management, maintaining low seed banks does become the management priority. And just some uh, evidence of this, so despite uh, a clear preference for, for uh, CA and, and uh, no-till and some um, there's still uh, relatively large amounts of uh, cultivation in terms of number of farmers cultivating small areas for strategic reasons. So in the southern region, you can see 27% there um, of land being uh, cultivated to some, to some extent, far less in, in Western Australia. And the main reason for that is due to weed management reasons. Similarly for burning. So there's still uh, burning that occurs. Uh, Farmers would prefer not to, but there still is burning. So 52% of farmers in southern regions burn some residue. Uh, relatively low areas, but still significant. And once again, uh, the most common reason for that is weed management uh, reasons. So let's look how things have evolved over time uh, with no-till and uh, some of the important weed management practices. So no tillage there at the top, and you can see uh, double knockdown and crop topping. They're two practices that I, I won't go into any detail, but they're herbicide-based practices aimed at weed seed bank uh, control and controlling potential resistant weeds. Uh, but the one I really wanted to focus on is narrow windrow burning, which is one of the most uh, remarkable cases of rapid adoption of a uh, no-till, of a, of a, sorry, this screen's gone missing there, <laughs> um, of a practice, uh, of a weed management practice. So here's an example of um, just how rapid this has been in different regions. The blue line at the top, so this is narrow windrow burning. First of all, let me explain the practice. So it's channeling the residue from the back of the harvester, which contains a large proportion of those uh, weed seeds, ryegrass in particular, and radish, to a lesser extent, brome grass, and channeling it into a row, allowing a narrow uh, stream of uh, burnt material. So instead of uh, burning 100% of the residue or a large proportion, it's about 50% of the residue that gets burned. And because of the heat and because of the concentration, it, it kills a very high proportion of the weed seeds in that uh, row. And you can see in some regions, starting with some of the Western Australian regions, just how quickly that has uh, been adopted. That's quite an extraordinary rate of uh, adoption for a, a non-chemical practice. And Sorry, I'm just looking at the screen. <laughs> um, and other practices uh, that are coming into play here. Uh, so this is about the coevolution. So not every farmer wants to burn, losing residue. The next one is some practices that are sh evolving uh, even further, applying the same principles, but hopefully not involving the removal of residue. And this is the Harrington Weed Seed Destructor, a common practice. Uh, uh, and, sorry, a new practice um, that is potentially very expensive for farmers, but one that's evolving and is now commercially available. So it's returning all of the residue to the, uh, to the, to the paddock and destroying the seed at the same time. It's also interesting that the weed management issues have driven farmers to increasing levels of legumes as well. So allowing greater diversity of weed management options. Uh, some other practices here along similar lines, trying to avoid the removal of, of residue but ach achieve the same weed management effect. Chaff tram lining, putting the chaff that contains the weed seeds into the wheel rows in controlled traffic situations, that's the one on the left. Chaff lining, putting that, uh, that residue that contains a high proportion of seeds in a narrow strip that is then controlled in different ways, that's a, a rapidly emerging practice. 
and also the precision fallow spraying. Instead of cultivating uh, large weeds in a fallow, it allows uh, high rates to be applied to large weeds, reducing uh, the likelihood of the need for cultivation. So you can see this is a, a development of uh, further weed management practices uh, that are consistent with the CA principles that uh, Australian farmers would prefer to use. Now one last thing I'll just uh, mention, I haven't mentioned livestock yet, but it's still an important part of the Australian farming system. It's very hard to integrate livestock in some situations when paddocks are, uh, fields are 200 hectares large. Uh, CSIRO and others are working on virtual fencing uh, using precision guidance of livestock wearing collars to guide where they uh, graze in the paddock. For cattle, it'll be commercially released uh, next year and allowing farmers to draw a, an area where they'd prefer grazing not to uh, occur to preserve the ground cover and then uh, hopefully preventing animals from entering or reducing the grazing intensity on that area. It'll be five, 10, 15 years before this sort of technology might be widely available and cost effective. And for sheep, it may be even longer because it's difficult to manage with sheep. Uh, but it's the technology that a lot of farmers are very seriously interested in developing because it's consistent, allows consistency with maintaining ground cover and still grazing large paddocks. So just to finish off, the major herbicide releases of the 1990s um, and herbicide tolerant crops allowed cropping systems to evolve without uh, necessarily relying on uh, weed management issues with little interaction. That changed rapidly. Weed management issues now means we're dealing with coevolution. And I guess, and farmers will prioritise weed management uh, from our experience above strict CA principles. But finally, I think there's the opportunity to look at what's happened here in this coevolutionary uh, development and consider perhaps in some other systems whether there can be some preemptive action to, uh, to follow this path and allow weed management to evolve consistent with, with CA. Thank you. So thank you very much. Nice presentation and good information. So we, we can go continue with Alba. You know, can you make your presentation, Alba, please? Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, to share and uh, exchange my experience with you. I'm Yalba. Uh, our work is soil management qualification and the no-till system in Santa Sofa in Brazil. Uh, here, uh, I present Solo Vivo Research Network. This natural work aims developing index indicators to access soil and water management quality in no tillage areas and to evaluate its uh, environment effects at catchment scale. We are 65 research and 21 institution. Uh, the coordination is of Embrapa. The financial support is divided in Brapa between Itaipu and Nacional. The Brazilian Federation of No Tillage is uh, an important uh, role that makes a um, link with our farmers. Uh, we are in uh, 60 states in uh, Santa Sofa, Brazil. Well, uh, no tillage is an important uh, system. Uh, it's pointed out as a strategy to protect soil against erosion and maintain good uh, yields. Uh, everybody knows uh, advantage this important system, but uh, when it's applied uh, in, uh, in conditions, in tropical condition, we have uh, challenges. 
uh, these areas are under no tillage in, in Brazil. We have some problems. For, for instance, reduce biodiversity and monocultural erosion and others. Then our network uh, to, um, uh, so sorry, I, I'm nervous, <laughs> uh, to want uh, promote this, 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 this system. Uh, Uh, here we can see let me uh, a point we can see uh, um, I see a catchment scan uh, we can see dots representing sample points uh, of crop and the soil quality indicator Here, we can see a station of a stream. Uh, here, uh, we are monitoring uh, water and sediments. We have some sensors in insta installed in uh, the streams uh, to monitor uh, water level, uh, rainfall, sediments and uh, our quality of water. Our network has, has a preliminary results, a rapid diagnostic of the soil structure. In Brazil, uh, we call DRESS. It's a visual indicator of soil structure quality. Uh, I, I put a, a little pictures, but uh, we can see in this in this picture we remove uh, uh, 25 centimeters a soil sample and surface layer and put in a, a draw, and it's possible to evaluate uh, a condition this a structure. If bad, uh, we have low score. If good, we have high scores. By uh, anthropogenic actions, uh, we can uh, uh, evaluate evidence of degradation or evidence conservation, and that it's, uh, it's possible to, to give a score Six is, is a good, and one is a, a, a bad. Uh, there are a web page. If you want uh, more information about this methodology, we have a whole meeting with technicians and farmers to evaluate this methodology. There's another, there's another uh, index uh, developed by Brazilian Federation of No Tillage is IQP, uh, Participatory of No Tillage Quality Index. Um, it's a structured questionnaire answered by farmer. Its results is scored so as to indicate the soil and water managed quality in each evaluated plot. This uh, index has uh, some uh, indicators. The, for more information, this index has a, a page. Okay. Um, this other index is a beta. Is an environmental performance index which evaluates management and conservation practice efficient to prevent erosion. Uh, we can see uh, um, a catchment uh, on the no tillage system uh, here that uh, 
station of the stream that I show showed with you. Uh, here uh, we are uh, monitoring uh, some some uh, indicators, but this index isn't uh, isn't ready. Isn't she, uh, we are uh, de developing. Uh, final consideration. Solo Vivo Network is developed other index. The index score is not put to, uh, to put constraints on the farmer, but uh, to all or her himself to evaluate quality of soil management and make the best decision to have good results in no tillage cropping. We believe that it's important to recognize the farmers who achieve good crop yields with soil and water management conservation and who generate environmental services for the society. Thank you. I'm so sorry about my English. Thank you very much, Alba. Good information also. So we will continue with Mr. Moros, please. Well, hello, thank you very much. <clears throat> so uh, I am going to share with you some of our results <clears throat> studying soil microstructure. <clears throat> well, the no-till no system has been rapidly adapted in, by Argentinian farmers, as you know, to overcome uh, several problems derived from the traditional cultivation methods. And there are several benefits uh, of, uh, from no tilling, uh, you know, well, all of that, an increase of organic matter and of the biological activity, higher efficiency of water harvesting, reduction of soil erosion, and lower cost of the agricultural production. Nevertheless, when soils begin to be cultivated under no till, a reorganization of soil structure takes place. And many authors have reported uh, higher consolidation, higher bulk density, higher soil strength, and a development of a platy structure, as you see there. And thus, the effects of no till on several physical and chemical soil properties are contradictory. In spite of those contradictory results, about uh, physical properties. The consensus is wider concerning the market transformations experimented by the soil biota and their no-till systems. And several comparative studies uh, have uh, evidenced significant increases in the number and diversity of, of soil fauna under no-till. And uh, although modifications of soil structure and uh, of soil fauna in the topsoil of no-till soils uh, are evident, uh, the promoting factors are not completely understood and their consequences on soil behavior were not uh, deeply considered. So um, according to the type of objects we are going to talk about and their sizes, uh, the microscopic methods applied on undisturbed, undisturbed samples are the most appropriate tools we consider for their study. So we use micromorphological methods as a method of uh, study undist undisturbed soil samples with uh, microscopes of different kinds. And the uh, main samples are the thin sections of about uh, 30 micrometers uh, th uh, thick. I'm, I'm going to show you several cases we have studied. One is the, fir the first one in the Cordoba province, province. Three soil conditions were compared, virgin soils, this plow, and no tillage. And 
we have found several microstructural zones in the first 10 centimeters of the soil. Uh, there you have what, uh, an example of the virgin soil where we described what we call a bio model. There you have tubular voids and a lot of excrements of fauna. And there, that represents 10 centimeter to the top to the bottom. And there you have uh, three different uh, micro horizons. And we compare it with a plow soil. Uh, we said it is a mechanical constructed model. And uh, it has a higher porosity, but uh, lower aggregate stability. And the consequence is the develop of a grass on the topsoil, as you see there. On the contrary, nautil soil was characterized by a subsurface zone with planar voids and platy aggregates. And we have uh, defined it, differentiated two structural model, models when describing soils under no-till. So the first microstructure microstructural model is what we call the platy model, as you see there, and, uh, where you have plates and planar voids. But besides that, we found what we call the biodisturbed model, where the plates are fragmented, and there are, there are a lot of compound packing voids. Uh, as a consequence of fauna activity. There you see uh, fragments of plates. The second case is in the south of this province, Santa Fe province, in the inner part of an agricultural farm field. There you see the typical platy model characteristic of uh, no-till soils here in this region, in the Pampa region, but also the biodisturbed model with the pheroidal pets. There you will see, and I mean it's uh, more in detail, uh, a plate that is disturbed by fauna activity. And besides, a densified model, uh, a massive, with massive uh, areas. Uh, these three types of uh, what we call microprofiles appear just opposed uh, abruptly or through transitional morphologies. There you see more in detail that uh, platy structure that is uh, drilled, tunneled, but uh, by a tubular boy with excrements, as you see there. Uh, and they are uh, besides uh, the drilling of the uh, plates, there, are, there is also a tilting of the, of the plate where it is possible to see on uh, this side. A, th a third case, also again the platy model, and uh, a bio disturbed uh, soil, typically, and also a densified model. Uh, it is in the inner part of an agricultural farm field. And uh, we found the, the densified model uh, more frequently after harvesting. A fourth case in the north part of Buenos Aires province. All those are uh, argudols. No? Uh, in this case, samples obtained after wheat soybean, uh, the sequence of wheat uh, and then uh, soybean. Uh, and we compare here the soil in the headlands uh, with a higher transit of machines with the center part of the farm field. So there, in the headlands, with a higher transit, you have uh, uh, more plates, while in the center part of the, of the farm, uh, there is a great activity of fauna uh, giving rise to the bio build uh, model. Yeah. Uh, so the topsoil in the headlands show a predominance of platy, the densified microstructural models, while in the central part there was a predominance of uh, bio builded models. 
Well, uh, another example, uh, a big project uh, called Biospace, uh, where we compare natural environments in different locations in the Pampian region with what we call uh, good agricultural practices under no-till. Uh, it means uh, more intensified uh, soils, um, agricultural sequences uh, with uh, cereals in the sequence uh, compared to what we call bad uh, agricultural practices and they're not no-till with a monoculture of soybean. So there you have the microstructure of the natural, of the soil in the natural environment uh, compared to the soil and their bad practices. And uh, it, they are the soil and their good practices, which is quite different from the others. And in more detail there, you, you can see the platy densify model with plates resulting from packing of the ground mass. Uh, compared to the soil and uh, uh, good agricultural practices with a lot of cereals in the agricultural sequence. And there you can see uh, a lot of crumbs, biopores, and what it is interesting, there are plates also, but those plates are quite different from the previews, in this case resulting from packing of uh, fecal pellets. So the conclusions are, the micromorphological study of a silty horizon, a silty A horizon of several no-till Pampia mollisols, including different areas inside the farm fields, different cropping sequences, and different moments during the agricultural cycle, has evidenced the development of morphological features typical of no-till system. The topsoil can be subdivided into three distinct micro-horizons, we call it, we number it one, two, and three. And accordingly, four different microstructure models seem to characterize the no-till system. The platy model exhibits a well-developed uh, platy microstructure and the biological model is dominated by tubular voice and in fillings, in fillings with uh, fecal pellets, with excrements of the fauna. And there we have subdivided into a biodisturbed microstructure where the platy aggregates uh, become broken and tilted, while when no remains of platy structures, uh, that represent a higher biological activity, we call it a bio microstructure, bio model. And finally, the densify model, where the main part of the uh, topsoil, the micro horizon two, has a dense packing and a very low porosity. So um, we consider that those microstructure densify and platy appear as a consequence of mechanical stresses due to uh, machinery traffic. While on the other hand, the increment of biological activity, mainly by fauna and roots also, of course, disturb plates producing biopores and rounded aggregates. Of course, uh, we can forget the role of macro, macrobiota, micro, microbiota, and uh, that uh, those uh, forces, the physical forces produced by machinery traffic and the bi biological activity of fauna act in opposition to each other. So the factors play in the development of those microstructures uh, would be the type of soil, uh, it differs according to the type of, of, of soils, and all the cases we have, uh, I have shown you uh, concern uh, silty soils, uh, pumpy and silty soils. 
uh, the ecological conditions and the management history. These studies clearly show that the microstructure of the surface horizon of soils under no till is the synthetic and dynamic result of those two opposing forces. And what is interesting, in spite of the increase of machinery traffic in intensified plots, a greater activity of the fauna promoted by a more continuous occupation of the soil with different crops has shown to counteract the compressive effects produced by, by traffic. And this result suggests that it is possible to improve soil properties and to achieve the sustainability of the no-till system by integrating no-till with management, management practices promoting the increase of uh, biological activity. Thank you. So thank you very much. We need to go directly for the presentation from Mrs. Lee, please. Take your place. Thank you. Thanks, Chair, for introduction. Um, I'm uh, Ling Ling Li from uh, Gansu Agricultural University, China. It's a great pleasure to be here and uh, share some of my work uh, on this uh, great event. Um, previously, uh, uh, presenters uh, shared their work in Australia, Brazil, and Argentina. Now I want to bring your attention to China. My presentation today is uh, conservation agriculture influence on soil crop environment in semi-arid Lewis Plateau, China. Um, mainly present uh, a global overview of the spread of conservation agriculture and the problems on the Lewis Plateau soil and water conservation history and also uh, uh, conservation agriculture influence on soil crop environment and followed by the uh, take home messages. Um, globally, uh, the conservation agriculture originated in 1930s uh, from uh, uh, North America. Uh, it's been widely uh, adopted uh, in around the world. Um, in China, there are lots of problems facing sustainable agriculture um, on the uh, Lewis Plateau. This is the Lewis Plateau map. And the total area is about 0 0.6 million uh, square kilometers, of which about 90% uh, was eroded. Um, these are the typical uh, uh, topographies on the Lewis Plateau. So on the Lewis Plateau, uh, hilly and gully area dominates the topography of, and make up more than 70%. Um, the rainfall distributed um, mainly uh, in summer and autumn. Uh, the average rainfall is uh, about uh, 390, uh, with a very, uh, uh, it's very uh, variable. And these are the maximum and the minimum temperature. It, uh, the temperature can uh, drop to minus 20, 22, and uh, the maximum can be uh, uh, 36 in summer. So the Main problems are too much plowing, stub or remove, and the uh, loose soil is erodible. Soil and water erosion take place mainly in slopes. So too much runoff and evaporation result in low and unstable uh, productivity. This gives the reason for the crop production could be uh, sustainably intensified if runoff and evaporation would be decreased. Um, Secondly, unreasonable cropping system is uh, another threat. Uh, too much grain crops, too much depleting crops, and not enough soil improving crops. Also high cost, low ratio between output and the input. So if we include legumes, could, uh, uh, this could improve soil fertility and economically efficiency. So, uh, next, I would like to introduce the history of conservation agriculture on the Lewis Plateau. Uh, 
CI systems on the Lewis Plateau can date back to ancient times, not what we call here uh, no-till or stubble retention, but soil and water conservation. Um, mulch is the most common technique of soil and water conservation in the area. And uh, uh, before 1960s, gravel, gravel and sand mulch. Um, this technique was invented much earlier but became popular uh, 200 to 300 years ago. And uh, this system involves growing crops on gravel, pebble, or sand mulch the lead. By this technique, um, we uh, re reality the crop production uh, in the area with only 200 to 300 millimeters of rainfall. Here are some pictures about, uh, oh, sorry the sad mulch, sad mulch with irrigation uh, and sad mulch in rain-fed areas. Um, these are the crops, uh, grain crops, uh, fruit trees, uh, also uh, vegetable crops, all can be uh, grown in using this technique. And then from late 1970s, uh, plastic mulch was introduced in China and modern conservation tillage research started from 1990s. And uh, in 2001, we uh, set up the very first conservation tillage research on the Western Lewis Plateau. Um, this experiment was designed uh, and uh, started in 2001, uh, including six treatments, conventional tillage, uh, tillage with stubble retention, no-till with no straw, and no-till with stubble uh, straw cover. Uh, conventional tillage with plastic mulch and no tillage with plastic mulch. These are the some equipment we used to implement the treatments and uh, some equipment for measuring uh, uh, penetration, um, uh, uh, to marry soil strength and uh, a runoff and soil infiltration. So using these techniques, we can have better water conserving in, at certain time, the surface soil water can be um, doubled, can be doubled. It's very important for the uh, emergence uh, of the uh, seeds. And after heavy rain, all the treatments uh, have uh, uh, crust, but it's more serious in traditional tillage treatments compared to no till with double retention. And uh, we can definitely got the uh, better soil quality. This uh, table shows the total organic carbon in uh, zero to 30 centimeters. No two with double retention uh, uh, increased uh, TOC at zero to 30 significantly. And uh, this uh, uh, diagram shows the water stable aggregates. In the no two with double retention, uh, we got the most water stable aggregates in all the layers from zero to 30 centimeters for both crop fields. And this diagram shows the uh, saturated hydraulic conductivity. So um, with no two with double retention, we uh, obtained the uh, most infiltration, the highest hydraulic conductivity. And uh, we also did a inter integrated uh, uh, evaluation of uh, soil quality index, including uh, soil physical, soil health, soil productivity, and uh, uh, using two methods, weighted integrated method and addition and multiplication uh, method. You, well, with uh, both methods, we got highest um, soil uh, quality index for uh, physical, soil fert fertility, soil health, and the soil productivity uh, with no till with stubble retention. So the best quality. And also the productivity was uh, improved significantly for both uh, spring wheat and field peas. Also, we measured the uh, CO2 uh, fl flux, uh, CO2 emission uh, in the in next, uh, in last three years. Uh, uh, for no till with stubble retention, uh, we got the lowest lowest uh, CO2 flux, but for traditional tillage, the highest. And this uh, table shows the uh, total emission of uh, CO2, N2O, and CH4, uh, CH4 absorption. Um, 
CO2 emission, N2O emission uh, was significant, significantly reduced by NO2 with double retention and the other absorption of CH4 increased significantly. Uh, also, uh, less erosion with no two with stable re uh, retention. Uh, uh, all treatments, uh, the, the erosion uh, happened in all treatments after heavy rain, but the uh, erosion in the NTS was the uh, uh, lowest. Uh, and these are some uh, simulated, uh, simulated uh, erosion um, experiment shows that uh, the uh, Stable retention reduces uh, erosion and the sediment. Also, uh, these are the uh, figures we obtained using rainfall simulator in that long-term experiment. So, uh, showed that NUTU with stable, stable retention had the high, with the same uh, amount of rainfall, uh, obtained the uh, lowest runoff and the highest infiltration and the lowest sediment. So, okay, thank you. Uh, China has a very long history of soil and water conservation practices. Lewis Plato is one of the places with the most serious eroding. Um, with the conservation agriculture, especially no to with double retention, could intensify crop productivity sustainably. Uh, and also conservation agriculture is a new life of the agriculture on the Lewis Plateau. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Lee. Thank you very much for everybody. We have time for one short question. We have some question in media or no? 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 Questions? Public, please, one here. Can you take a microphone? Davidson from Embrapa, Brazil. Uh, my answer, my, my question is for Mrs. Lee. And you showed us uh, probably the most serious case of erosion in the world. Uh, I've read about it, and including National Geographic. And um, what about the conversion to perennial? You told that, uh, that there are grain cropping over there. Is there, how is the rate of conversion to perennials? Over, do, uh, perennials as a possible solution to reduce the erosion and uh, uh, an alternative systems. So your question is? If there, if there, uh, if it has been a conversion in, in, instead of grains to perennials, like fruits or whatever. You mean you got it? shift from uh, grain production to other crops? Yeah, other crops like perennials. Perennial yeah. crops. Yeah. Um, yeah, it is possible. In one of my slides, you see that uh, with uh, lucent, we had uh, the uh, lowest. Um, we had the lowest erosion, both for uh, runoff and sediment. But this area is a traditional uh, food crop production area. Uh, if we transfer all the crops to perennial like uh, lucent, we are facing lots of uh, social problems. So have to uh, shift to other uh, crop production techniques like uh, conservation tillage. Yeah. One more. Okay, sorry, we don't have more time, but you can ask directly for the, the actors and the presenters here. And we invite you to, to be in room to the next activity, to the next session here. Thank you very much. Good continuation for everybody. And congratulations for the actors.